Welcome, fellow entrepreneurs, to the Amazon Sellers School Podcast, where we talk about Amazon and how you can use it to build an e commerce empire, a side hustle, and anything in between. And now, your host, Todd Welch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Amazon Seller School. Today, I've got Leah McHugh with me. She is a consultant over with e-commerce Chris, where they help you with all of the no fun stuff. Like if you have account health related issues, your account get banned, your products get taken down, all that stuff that gives us nightmares. So Leah, I appreciate you coming on the show. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Anything uh, uh, you want to tell us about your background, how you got into this Amazon game? I mean, how did you even learn how to do this kind of stuff? A lot of people don't know where to start when it comes to account health stuff. Yeah. I have been working with Amazon since 2011. Um, I hadn't even bought anything on Amazon when I started working on the platform. Um, and I started working with Chris in 2015. Okay, nice. So I had, I had basically been running the operations um, for a brand prior to working with him. We started working together and realized that we sort of had opposite sides of the coins of experience. Um, and so the rest of it was just sort of learned on the job, yeah. <laughs> uh, dealing with it for however many years that is, nine years All now. right, cool. So you started working, doing this type of stuff in 2011 and hadn't even purchased. Yeah, well, I started with Amazon in 2011. Okay. Account health stuff started 2015. Got it, okay. So you started selling in some way on Amazon in 2011? Yeah, then? yeah so I was I was working with brands back yep. then. So so managing operations and logistics for, for other okay. brands. So Amazon was one of the channels that we sold on, but I was also, you know, doing EDI for major stores, things Got like it. that. Okay. So you're, you're a uh, OG in the Amazon space for sure. <laughs> yes. You've been doing this a long time. So I've seen a lot of crazy stuff, I'm sure, which we'll dive yes. into some of that today. <laughs> and then we're also going to be diving into some of the crazy stuff that's been happening more recently, like uh, variation manipulations and even correct variations getting taken down, bundles getting taken down for various reasons, um, AI tools that we can use to help with enforcement as well. And of course, the uh, the lovely low inventory fee, we're going to be talking about uh, how Amazon's kind of messing with us on that as well. So I'm uh, definitely looking forward to this one. So why don't we, uh, what's the biggest one of those four that you guys are seeing right now in the business? Uh, so we're still seeing quite a number of bundle suspensions where it's actually the entire account being removed for bundles. Um, and also the, the listing variations, we're also seeing a number of account suspensions due to incorrect variations. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, and dive into that. So uh, for anybody that isn't familiar with selling bundles and such like that. Let's start off with, you know, what typically people have been doing and uh, go into what they've been doing particularly wrong and how they can fix it. Yeah. So a bundle on Amazon is essentially when you take multiple products and you put them together under one mm -hmm. ASIN. Um, they have fairly specific rules about how to decide what category the bundle goes in and how to decide what the brand name for the bundle should be uh, and what people have been doing rather than following those rules is often brand bundling major brands together and then listing it under their own brand mm -hmm. or including a very small item of their own brand in the bundle and then bundling the entire bundle under their own brand. Um, and, and so Amazon has started suspending accounts for doing that. Yeah, and and that's something. Uh, I mean, I've I'm guilty of of doing it for sure. It's been a thing for a long time, um, and I I think overall something that's been very beneficial to Amazon customers to be able to get those bundles. So what what do you think has Amazon always had the exact same policy regarding bundles, and why do you think they're starting to enforce it only now? Yeah, they have always had this policy. <laughs> Um, it's, I, I think one, they're probably getting flack from major brands because mm -hmm. it is usually major brands that we see being bundled 
under somebody else's brand, usually not a big brand, uh, usually just a brand that was created to make bundles on Amazon. Um, and so I think yeah. they're getting a lot of pushback from a lot of these major brands. And I also think that they are at a point now where it probably isn't great for their customers that are, there are all of these misbranded products being sold on their website because it is somewhat misleading um, and people don't necessarily understand what it is that they're buying. Yeah, for, for sure. And I haven't had any problems with any of my bundles. And that's probably because I, all the brands that I use, if I named them now, probably 99% of the people listening have never heard of them. So mm -hmm. I work with a smaller brands. They A lot of them sell very well, um, but they're definitely not household brands. But you're seeing a majority of them are with big household brands that most people would know? Yeah, and we're also seeing the majority of the account suspensions are accounts that are creating large amounts of these bundles. Mm. Um, so it's usually not just they have one or two of these listings and then a bunch of other different kinds of listings. It's usually a large percentage of their catalog or a large number of incorrect bundles within their catalog. And to be clear, like you can make correct bundles mm -hmm. as, as long as you follow their policy in terms of what the brand of the bundle is and, and what category it goes in. Yeah. So, and that seems to be the key thing, right? If, if you have branded products in your package, then whatever the most expensive product is, that needs to be the brand of the bundle, correct? And yeah, and that also dictates the category of the bundle. And the category, so, yeah. So, so yeah, the most expensive is what the ex most expensive item is what Amazon calls the main item yep. in the bundle, and, and so so that dictates the brand and and the category. And I think the reason why a lot of sellers aren't using the the major brand as the brand is because they usually don't have authorization from the brand, exactly, and so then yeah. they can't provide the branded UPC code that would allow them to create that bundle. Correct. Yeah. So you, if you want to do it, you're pretty much forced to do it under your own UPC. Well, or get letter of authorization from the brand, which some people do do and, and create fully compliant bundles that way. So like if you're working with smaller brands, it would probably be fairly easy to get authorization from them to create those bundles. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's typically what I do is usually get, I'm, I'm usually already partnering with them in some way anyways to sell their products. And then I'm like, well, Let's make this bundle and uh, sell a lot more, and usually they're they're good with that. So, um, but I I don't necessarily list it under their brand all the time. Sometimes I do uh, if they're willing to give me a UPC, but if they're not, then I'll just list it under you know my generic brand that I have set up for the bundles. But I think the odds of those ever getting taken down are are pretty low. Because it sounds like, at least right now, Amazon is just looking at the the people who are giving them some flack, the brands who are saying, hey, we don't want all this going on kind of thing. Yeah, it is still a violation of the policy, though. Yeah. I, would, I would recommend listing it under the correct brand. Uh, you can also request a UPC exemption for bundles. It's usually just because if the brand is a major brand, they don't allow exemptions. For those bundles, yeah. um, but also just in general, any item that you're bundling, you want to make sure that you have a letter of authorization from that brand, even if they aren't the main brand in the bundle, because what they're asking these sellers for are letters of authorization from every single brand that they bundle. Okay. So you've even seen it where, let's say they're with a brand and they got G10 exemption, they created the bundle under the brand's name and in the proper category and everything you're still ha seeing them having trouble if they don't have that letter of authorization? Uh, those aren't being flagged, but but you should have a letter of authorization. I mean, just in general, if yeah. you're selling a brand, Be it's safe. good to have a letter of authorization because Amazon can ask for that at any point. What we're seeing with the people that are suspended is, is that part of the reinstatement process is providing letters of authorizations for all of the brands that they were bundling. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, the moral of the story is make sure... The branding and everything is good. If you're doing it under the brand of a big name brand, make sure you have a letter of authorization. Any brand, really, get that letter of authorization, yeah. like you said, better safe than sorry. Um, or, I, I mean, have you seen the listings taken down? So let's say I'm bundling um, some Frito-Lay's chips, right? Like three different flavors. And then... I grab 
something and put my logo on it from Alibaba that, you know, goes into the bundle that would go with that well. And the price of that is a little bit higher than the the chips. And so you list it under your own brand in your own category and everything. Have you seen any bundles that are set up properly that way still get taken down? So that wouldn't be a violation of the bundling policy. However, you are using Frito-Lay's trademark yep. in your listing. So you still would need to have a letter of authorization and could be asked for a letter of authorization okay. for that bundle. Just because it's in the photos, even if you didn't mention it in the, the text. I mean, obviously you'd want to, but I'm just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. So the photos as well. Yep. So yep. I mean, also if people receive it and they has their trademark. Yep. Okay. And then, uh, so one thing, you know, after this all started going down, I, I reread the, the bundling, um, uh, policy again, just to make sure I knew and understood it well. And one thing that is not clear in there is that it, uh, it doesn't have any clarification about if the products in your bundle are all generic. It almost makes it sound like you can't make a bundle if all the products are generic in the product. Uh, yeah, it does. It does specify that you can't bundle generic products. So even if everything's generic, but then I guess you could create your own product with a brand, right? And bundle those generic products with you. Uh, well, so no, no item within a bundle is supposed to be generic because Amazon's concern is that it could confuse customers into thinking that those generic product products were part of whatever the brand yeah. was. So what really concerns me with that is like they're they're totally kind of taking away the whole like gift basket industry, essentially. Uh, well, so a gift basket isn't necessarily a bundle. Well, wouldn't they wouldn't they consider it a bundle because you might have like sausages from different brands and crackers and chips and dip and stuff and they're all different brands and you're going to lift it under you know Todd's gifts or whatever and so well so that's if if they're under different brands if you're bundling a bunch of items together and then so for a gift basket generally gift baskets don't have branded items and then generally gift, gift bags as baskets are branded under whatever the basket brand is. And then the rest of the items are generic um, or branded under that initial brand. So, so the, the gift baskets are treated slightly differently because bundled items are, are generally considered items that, that are sold separately as well as within the bundle. Whereas a gift, gift basket, a lot of times those items aren't sold individually. They're only sold in the gift basket. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that would make sense. Um, but you know, like I've bought gift baskets for people and they'll have like, you know, branded sausages and crackers and cheese and mm -hmm. all those things put together. Um, but then, you know, it's selling under the the brand of whoever made the gift basket. Um, so essentially, though, that that would be a violation of the the bundling policy if Amazon came across that. Potentially, if 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 the brand of the gift basket has an item of under its own brand of greater value than the items within the gift basket, yeah. then that would be totally fine. Um, but again, you would want to have letters of authorization from all of the brands that are within the basket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a uh... It definitely makes it uh, hard to do bundles for sure, but essentially just get that letter of authorization and work with smaller brands and you're, you're probably be good. Yeah. I mean, I think they're just trying to clean up the catalog. I think a lot of places have taught that you can create your own bundle as a way to make a listing that no other seller can sell on. So essentially Amazon has a whole bunch of mostly duplicate bundles just under different people's brands that they've made up to do this. So, so rather than having millions of listings that are kind of the same, this makes it so they're better bundles that, that can be sold by multiple sellers or even, you know, the major brands themselves. Yeah. And that makes sense. I mean, uh, any bundle that I create, I always try to make sure that it's something pretty much unique. Like if there's a million copies of it out there, I'm not even going to look at creating it. Anyway, so I try to create more unique things, smaller brands, have the authorization, uh, ideally listed under the brand's um, trademark if they're mm -hmm. willing to give you a UPC. And if not, try to get that G10 exemption, I guess. And that'd be the, the best way moving forward if you want to keep doing bundles. Yep, exactly. Yep, for sure. 
Okay. Very good. Um, so one of the other things that we were talking about was, uh, and I've had some troubles with this as well as variation manipulation and variations getting broken up. Now mine weren't variation manipulation. In my opinion, I thought it was a legit variation and helpful to the customer. So I'm curious. Most sellers do. Just to- <laughs> yeah. Well, for example, like I was selling these mounts for boats, right? Mm-hmm. And you got one mount that doesn't have a GPS. The other one's exactly the same, but it does have a GPS. One has a 25 degree angle. The other is a zero degree angle. So yeah, I, you put those in a variation so people can click and select well, the, which one. What variation for. theme were you using for those? Yeah. The only one that really worked for it was a style variation. Uh, kind of, not really, <laughs> but, uh, you know, different style, different angle, GPS no. So that was the closest one that I could come up with. And mm-hmm. when they're broken up, it makes it extremely hard for the customers to figure out exactly, uh, what they're looking for and come across the right thing. So in my mind, it made a lot more sense. And we've since had a case and we're good now, but what are you guys seeing uh, at this point in terms of, uh, variations? with people getting broken up. Yeah. So like I said, most sellers are creating variations that they think are better for the customers. Um, the main thing to keep in mind is that Amazon is extremely literal and when they, when they give those variation themes. Mm -hmm. So whatever the variation theme is, the products can only vary specifically by that. Um, and it needs to be the same for each one as well. So, so your example where one has a GPS, one doesn't, and then one is a different angle and one is a different angle, you know, they they are, I guess, technically varying by styles, but Mm -hmm. they're varying in different ways from each other. Um, so, so you need to make sure that you are very literally using the variation theme available and the variation themes available are, are different for every, um, Correct. item type keyword. So, so you, you also need to be looking at what available variations there are for your product, because a lot of times people put them in a wrong category when there is actually a variation theme that would work for the variations that they're creating. Um, so if, if you're using a size variation, size specifically refers to like dimensions or small, medium, large size doesn't refer to quantity. Mm-hmm. If, if quantity is, is how your products vary, then, then you should be using item package quantity or quantity depending on the category. Um, and so, so we do see people get in trouble a lot for the stuff like that, where they actually could have used the correct variation. It was available to them. They just didn't realize. Yep. Um, but what we mostly see people get in trouble for is just incorrectly using variation. So they've decided that they want these listings all together on one detail page. Mm-hmm. And so they just pick any variation theme. Uh, color seems to be a popular one for some reason. Yeah, um, and then just the put, <laughs> yeah, right. and then just put completely different information into the color attribute yeah, or yeah. color and something that. else into the color attribute. Yep. Um, and so that that technically is actually two violations because you're you're misusing variations and you're also misusing the attribute um, for whatever attribute yeah, you're using yep. for the theme so so you really need to look at it very literally rather than how you would like the products put together um, because that's how amazon looks at it yep um, and they do get it wrong i have seen asins broken up that did genuinely vary by the theme used but i haven't seen that many mistakes on that one it is usually the seller that has created incorrect variations in my experience Yeah, yeah, probably a a really good example. I just thought of another one that I had broken up that we had to put back together. And so it was a fishing lure and the fishing lure varied by color, but because it's a fishing lure, the color names were like pumpkin, watermelon and bass and shad Mm -hmm. and basically names of like different fish. And then as a fisherman, you know, the colors of those fish. And so Amazon broke that up. So in cases like that, uh, how are you uh, advising people to try to get that fixed if they are confident that it's the correct variation? So that is usually where we see Amazon make mistakes where it's a color name, like, like makeup has a similar thing where they'll use some fun name instead of the actual color. Mm -hmm. Um, Generally speaking, that can be appealed. Um, A safer way would be to just use a generic color name 
rather rather than the fun name yeah. in the listing, which I understand for makeup probably is not great because people are probably searching for the actual color name. Yeah. Um, and so so it is it is appealable. But if it's not something where people are specifically going to be searching for that fun name, I would recommend just using a more generic color name or a more obvious color name. Yeah. 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 If you're, if you can in like fishing, watermelon pumpkin is like one of the most popular colors for any base. So people search for that all the time. And so is it typically a case in that case where they want to reuse the names that they have and it is correct? Is it just a simple seller support ticket that you're doing or are you having to go above that? Uh, support can't like green light variations. Um, you would need to appeal it with the seller performance team okay. or, or the category manager if you have access to your category manager. Because usually the way they are policed are, are determined by the category manager. Okay. So you'd have to escalate it to seller performance, you said? Yeah. Well, so if they've broken up your listings, you already have a dialogue with seller performance. They'll, they'll mm -hmm. give you an appeal form. Um, and they do now give you the option to dispute if you if you can prove that it is a valid variation, okay. Yeah. Um, so, so you would need to you would need to dispute it via the appeal form that they give you. All right. Yeah, and just uh, work through that pro process. Hopefully, you get somebody that knows what you're talking about. In my case, somebody that knows something about fishing, <laughs> but probably not. Well, or you just have to you know doc show it to them, yeah, explain it, yeah, and clearly if it's, if in a way that they would understand on the product too. That's probably helpful, right? If it says watermelon, pumpkin, shad, shrimp, and all that stuff. Yeah. And yes, but also, you know, if that could also refer to shape, right? Yeah. Um, so, so being able to show that they are in fact the colors that they're referring to. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, anything else with variations that you've been, been seeing or that people should watch out for anything that's maybe triggering it more than something else? Um, I think the main trigger is the FTC. <laughs> um, so because, you know, when you create a variation family, that merges the reviews. Um, the FTC actually, mm. I think it was last year. It may have been the year yeah. before. Um, the FTC actually sued a supplement seller for create, for merging reviews incorrectly on Amazon to inflate the review count. Um, and so I believe that's why we're seeing greater enforcement around variations because they do affect reviews and, and ratings for the products, at least to the what, what customers can see. Yeah. So, so it is important to make sure that they are correct. And it's also important to not, you know, I'll often see sellers put in a listing that has nothing to do with that particular variation family. They just don't have any stock of it anymore, but they want to use those reviews for other products. Yeah. That is exactly what the FTC sued somebody for. So I would recommend not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's exactly what Amazon is looking for. People using this to try to inflate reviews and in plate sales rank. Okay. Yeah. And that is annoying. As a customer, I've seen that, you know, you're looking at a product and it's like, oh, 4.7, a thousand reviews. Yeah. And then you click to the reviews and I'm like, that's not the product I'm looking at. Right. And then you go to the <laughs> variations and there's like 20 different pro different products that have nothing to do with yeah. each other together. So yeah, that I, I definitely get for sure. And then I, you know, the legitimate ones that a lot of times are caught up in that. As I said uh, the other day, uh, Amazon doesn't operate with a scalpel. They operate with a sledgehammer. So you get a lot of collateral well, damage. Most of this enforcement is, is mostly automated. Yeah. Um, the, the investigation afterwards is, is a real person, but a lot of, a lot of the enforcement that they're doing are keyword based. Um, and it's their algorithms that are, are searching through for these, um, or their, their AI now, their AI yep. can analyze images if they think that they look like they vary in more ways than you're saying. Yep. Um, it, it's, it's more of an automated flag, which is why you'll see these mistakes rather than an actual person reviewing it. But like I said, once you get to the appeal stage, it is an actual person reviewing your appeal. Um, yep. And so, so that's where you can present st the information, but you just need to make sure that you are actually following the variation theme that they've set out. Yep. Yep. Well, that's good. At least there, uh, it sounds like the, the seller for performance team at least has a good idea on what's going on and they, they can be helpful then in your experience so far. Uh, I mean, they've, they've done a lot of these at this point. Um, I mean, in general, they don't, you know, the seller performance team isn't exactly totally versed in how Amazon's catalog works. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, showing them a flat file or showing them a processing report isn't, going to do anything. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, they are 
human beings who can look at a product and see that, yes, it only varies by color or size or whatever, whatever you're saying that it, it does vary by, whereas AI can get confused more easily. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, AI is definitely very helpful in a lot of things, but it does get things wrong a lot as well. And it's, you know, it's learning still in its early stages. So we'll see where it goes from here. It'll get better and better over time, which, uh, hopefully will help the good guys and hurt the bad guys who are doing it just to manipulate the system and help those mm-hmm. who are just trying to help the customers and provide a better shopping experience. Yeah. We've also seen Amazon use their AI to try to improve variations. Um, unfortunately, the examples I've seen of that have not been great, um, where they actually will break up somebody's variation family to create one that their system thinks is a better variation family um, mm-hmm. and is often completely incorrect. I have yet to see them actually enforce against a seller for the incorrectly created AI variations, um, but it is very no, difficult be... to... It is very difficult to fix them, though, because it, they their internal team has a higher level att- of attribution than a yep. seller. And was so that on a that, brand registered brand? Oh, yeah. These were large brands. Um, Amazon's internal teams have the highest level of attribution, well above brand registry. Um, and even above brand registry would be vendor. So that was actually a way we'd saw a lot of listing abuse happening was somebody with a vendor account or somebody who maybe bought a vendor account would mess up people's variations and mess up people's listings using Vendor Central because Vendor Central has higher levels of contribution than Brand Registry does. So then the brand has to fight to try to get it corrected. Yeah, and I, I think the the more the AI gets involved in things, it's giving a lot of people nightmares in that you know some of these brands, they spend countless man hours honing their listings, right? And then the idea that AI can just come in and be like, poof, now you got a new listing because I think this is better probably will drive a lot of people crazy if they see that happen. Yeah. And you can opt out of it in Seller Central. It's not guaranteed to fully opt you out of it, but it does stop the system from automatically optimizing your listings for you. Uh, yes. Which is- I- I heard something about that. Is there a specific place in Seller Central you go to do that? There's like, I can can send it to you. There's multiple steps. So it's hard to explain verbally. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. That would be cool. If you're willing to share that, we can throw it in the show notes. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. So if anybody wants that, check out the show notes and you can get the instructions on how to opt out of AI, even though AI might override your opt out of AI. So. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm having that problem with Google right now. I've opted out of their search result summary, and I still always get the search result summary. So <laughs> yes, I'm I'm having that trouble with I forget what it's called, but you can subscribe to get uh, like results sent to you on certain keywords, and I unsubscribe multiple <laughs> times every week, and it just keeps sending yep. them. <laughs> and I don't want to delete it because I do want to be able to click over there and see the results, but maybe I got to delete it and recreate it Start again <laughs> yeah but uh yeah it's going to be an interesting world moving forward as ai takes over more and more things and uh just kind of guesses or and thinks it's guessing right and a lot of times it's going to get stuff wrong until it's maybe eventually it'll get there um yeah. but for now it gets a lot of things wrong yeah for sure <laughs> All right, cool. So what else we get, do we have? We've got uh, the low inventory fees on the slowly received shipments, which was something that was brought up early when these low inventory fees came out. Like, How is Amazon going to handle that if it's their own fault that right. the stock didn't get received in? So it sounds like you guys have been seeing some of that. Yeah, and it's not all accounts, but we have definitely seen some accounts getting charged low inventory fees when their inventory has been waiting to be checked in into FBA for weeks. Um, So just something that I think that it's good for sellers to be aware of because they may not even realize that they're being charged these fees and they would absolutely be able to get a reimbursement on them. So definitely want to check your low inventory fees and see when they were being applied and whether you had inventory waiting to be checked into FBA during that time. Especially now, because they're getting slower as we go further and further into Q4, right? They're busy and then yes. everything takes longer. Yeah, it's been pretty horrible for me the last couple of weeks. It's like 
I've got these pallets that have been delivered for like two weeks now and they're just sitting yep. there. Even UPS Everybody. has been delivered for a week or two and it's still just sitting there. Yeah, everybody's experiencing long check-in times. It's, yeah. I mean, it happens every Q4, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so is there any, do you know of any uh, easy way, uh, I guess, to look into that to see if the long-term storage fees and match them up to particular shipments that took forever to receive in? Or is that just something you kind of got to figure out some spreadsheet magic or something like that. Yeah, you have to look at your fees reports and then look at your your shipment reports and figure it out. Uh, I don't know if any of the reimbursement companies will do that for you. But... Okay, yeah, that was going to be my next question. <laughs> if you knew of any that are doing that yet? Yeah, we don't we don't do reimbursement. So. <laughs> yeah, I would guess uh, that they're on it, trying to figure it out if they haven't already. So it, I would definitely speak to Gatita about that as well. Even if they don't offer it as a service, they probably know the best way to put that data together. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's going to be a big thing. I mean, Amazon's like, no, we promise that won't happen. But everybody knew. There's it was always errors. <laughs> Amazon's not that good at its own systems and it doesn't have any uh, uh, reason to be perfect at its own systems. So they right. put it back on you. Yep, exactly. Uh, very good. And uh, the last thing that we had wanted to talk about was the, the AI tool enforcement for compliance. So is that becoming a, a big thing that people are doing and you're seeing them run into issues with it or are they being successful with it? Are you guys utilizing it? Uh, what, um, are your, what are you seeing uh, with AI for which, that? Which AI tool? There's a few. Um, so any of them, I guess. ChatGPT is obviously the, the biggest, but then you've got Claude and Bard and Grok. And for listing ones. for for product compliance yeah so uh, for like writing um um LOAs and such to uh you know to get a product back up or if your account is taken down are you seeing uh, any success with AI writing those kind of things or helping with account health stuff no <laughs> <laughs> to be to be perfectly blunt um i mean you definitely don't want to use ai to make or manipulate documents um mm -hmm. if if amazon's asking you for letters of authorization you need to get real letters not, of authorization <laughs> not LOA. um that's the wrong acronym oh poa uh, poa yeah plan of action oh, yeah no no they do not work well <laughs> no <laughs> i've been asked this before if i'm worried that it's going to affect what we do and no. <laughs> yeah. It's uh it it can be helpful in a lot of things, uh writing emails and stuff like that, but what I have noticed like when, if you're someone who's in the space and you're up on on all the new stuff going on and you ask ChatGPT to write you something like that, it's typically out of date in a lot of ways. It's referencing like old information and not necessarily helpful in information anymore. It's also just too generic. I mean, a POA isn't just regurgitating information to Amazon. They're they're looking for very specific information about the issue that they've suspended you for. So yeah. so just giving them a generic plan of action for the investigator that just gives them an excuse to only read a few lines and then deny it, which is great for them because they're, they're measured on speed. So the faster they can reject your appeal, the better it is for them. Um, and in my experience, most sellers are not great at identifying the root cause themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> and AI can't do that for you. Yeah. Yeah. AI is good at rewriting what you've already created yeah. and you know is good and you tell it to make it better, it's very good at that. Um, but more advanced things, it's not necessarily that good at just generating it itself. So definitely, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't rely on it. But It also uh, has a tendency to make stuff up when it doesn't have a lot to say, um, which you also yes. definitely don't want in your plan of action. Yeah, it, I've definitely caught it doing that as well. <laughs> like uh, having it writing phishing articles and stuff, and then you read through it and it's like 90, 95% perfect. But then it's mm -hmm. like, eh, that's not correct. Where the heck did you get that kind of information? So yeah, you definitely got to watch out 
for that kind of stuff. I would also be very surprised if Amazon wasn't using some sort of tool to identify when AI is being used. They are yeah. the they are the second largest data company in the world. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's ones that are better, but I've seen those ones that are available online that you know detect AI, and the the detection rate is very low. The, the accurate detection rate, mm -hmm. whether there's something better, you know, that companies like Amazon and such are using behind the scenes, maybe, probably. Um, it's hard to say for sure. Um, but if you, if you teach it right and you know what to say to it, like to not use certain words that they often overuse, you can trick those AI detection systems pretty quickly. Yeah, I just, you know, I see enough of other people's appeals that I can usually fairly accurately identify who wrote it. Um, yeah. And I don't look at them all day, every day, whereas Amazon's investigators are looking at these all day, every day. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they can detect when something is, is not being properly written. Sure. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to that, let's dive into it more since we're talking about it. So if someone gets their brand registry suspended or their account suspended or an ASIN taken down, mm -hmm. by the time do they come to you, I'm going to guess they've probably already tried things themselves. Not and always. So not always. Nope. Are there certain things though that people definitely should not do before they contact someone like you that can make the situation even worse? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, like I, I had mentioned previously, don't fake documentation if you don't have it. That takes a suspension to a permanent deactivation because you've now committed fraud as far mm -hmm. as Amazon's concerned. Also, don't manipulate documents. So if, if your document doesn't have what is needed from Amazon for Amazon, don't add it <laughs> yourself. I mean, certainly if it's an invoice and some information is missing from it, you can certainly ask your supplier to add yeah. whatever the missing information is. Um, but if you add it yourself, it will very likely get, get flagged as manipulation. And then there's just nothing we can do to help you at that point. I would also make sure that you're reading whatever checkboxes you're checking off before you check them off. Mm -hmm. um, we saw a lot of ASINs be... We, we were able to fix it, but it was a lot harder to fix because they had already checked off a box saying that they understand the violation and, and they agree that they committed it when they hadn't committed. Mm -hmm. They just thought they could check the boxes off and everything would be fine. It makes it that much more difficult for us to fix something if you admit to something that you didn't do um, or if you lie. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Also, if, if they try to, if you, if you have people's emails within Amazon and you just try to spam as many people internally as you can, we can't unburn those bridges. Um, so sometimes people are just too far gone for us to help. We get less of that now. We used to get a lot more of it. I think people have learned to you only get so many shots at this. So we yeah. do get a lot of people who come straight to us and then some people give it, you know, a try themselves and, and then realize that they should be working with somebody else for it. Yeah. So basically you know, take a step back, take a breath, yes. figure out <laughs> your plan before you move forward. Don't just click a bunch of boxes and be like, dang you, Amazon, you guys are idiots. This is not correct. And because that ain't going to help at all. It just, it makes it, if Amazon's already decided that they don't need to take you seriously, it, it makes it a lot more difficult to get them to read anything you submit after that. Yes. So you just need to, a lot of sellers think that the first thing that they need to do is appeal. That should not be the first thing that you do. The first thing that you do is look into what it is that Amazon is accusing you of figure out if, if that is even correct, um, and then make the plan from there and then appeal. Yep. I, I understand the knee-jerk reaction to just want to fix it, but but that's usually where the most damage happens. <laughs> yeah, especially if you know that Amazon is in the wrong on it because that you're just getting driven crazy. And that does happen fairly mm -hmm. often where you know it's a false flag or whatever, and so you just want to yell at someone over at Amazon for being stupid and... Yeah, you got to be business person and be well, professional. Well, and, and unprofessional language is in and of itself a reason for Amazon to suspend an account. I have actually seen accounts suspended because people were unkind to Amazon Teams yep. um, or spamming Amazon Teams. So, so you don't want to give them yet another reason to not reinstate your account. 
Yeah. And that's why I have my employees do most of the seller support <laughs> tickets. If I do have to, then I jump over to chat GPT and I write my angry letter there and tell it to write this nicely for seller support for me. And then it gives me a nice mm-hmm. reply back. But yeah, it's uh, it can be frustrating sometimes, but you got to you gotta make sure you're always professional and do it properly. Yeah. And, and you can be forceful. I mean, I don't, I'm not saying you have to agree with anything they tell you mm-hmm. and you don't have to, you, you can absolutely push back. You just have to do it in a respectful manner. Yep, exactly. And if it's something that's super critical, uh, like your most popular ASIN or your whole account is taken down or brand registry, then think twice maybe about doing it yourself and instead reach out to professionals like you guys and make sure that it's done correctly the first time, especially if your livelihood's on the line. Yeah, it's kind of, it's always surprising to me how comfortable people are playing roulette when it's their entire account. (laughs) Yeah, for some reason, Amazon makes people feel that way because I think (laughs) a lot of people still don't see it as like a real business. It's like, you know, a side gig kind of thing and a hustle. And it's just, it's not really that anymore. And Amazon is trying to make sure it's not that. They want professionals, real businesses, real brands on their platform. Yeah. And a lot of those things, you know, if they, if they suspend your account and you don't get it reinstated or they suspend your brand from brand registry and you don't get it reinstated, that also blocks you from ever registering another brand through brand registry. And it also, any, any account that you try to create after you have a suspended account that you don't get reinstated is likely to get related to that account and then immediately Mm -hmm. get reinstated for being uh, sorry, immediately get suspended for being related to that suspended account. So yep. so it isn't just a throwaway type thing. It also affects all of your future business with Amazon. And I, I don't, a lot of people don't necessarily understand that with brand registry. If, if one brand gets removed from brand registry, you're marked as abusive. Yep. And any brand you try to add, or if somebody tries to add you as a user to their brand, you will that will also get marked as abusive and you won't be able to access. Yeah. I've seen that it can cascade from your brand registry to other people's brand registry. If you just happen to be a user in their account. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. So it's very important to one fix problems, but two also make sure that you have very clear documentation for anybody that accesses any of your accounts. And so if it's an employee, you need to have very clear employment, letters, termination letters, removing their account access when when they are terminated or if they are terminated. And same yep. with any contractors that you're using, you need to be able to provide any sort of contract um, to show that relationship to Amazon if they ever do decide to relate any abuse because of a user on your account. Yep. Yeah. Documentation uh, to back up whatever you say, at least like email chains and stuff for termination and things like that. But if official letters are, would be even better. Yeah. Make Legal sure documents are always the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. In the, in the case that I seen, um, it, it worked with the email chain that showed the termination of the employee that was doing the uh, abusive behavior. And so that was able to clear that up and get things restored, but you know, not an easy process. Yeah, and and it can work with, with things like that. But what we tend to find with most of Amazon's enforcement teams is as they do more of these types of enforcements, their requirements to provide proof get higher. Um, mm-hmm. So you'll see similarly with like test reports for product compliance. Yeah. Now, Amazon will only accept test reports from specific labs for some products. Um, and Amazon actually does call labs now and verify that documentation because so many people were submitting fake docs. Yep. So so yep. so the longer that they are enforcing something, usually the the higher the standard for the documentation becomes. Yep. Absolutely. All right, well very good. Any other uh major issues that you've seen uh, crop up at as of late that people should be aware of? I mean, so the the listing compliance stuff is is the main one that we've really seen spike. I mean, certainly we see all kinds of suspensions all the time. Um but those are the two big spikes that we've seen this year. Um, everything else is pretty much kind of the usual amount <laughs> yeah. of those types of suspensions. And with the listing compliance, you're talking about like not having the proper documentation and stuff like that for products. 
Uh, I meant I meant the bundles and the variations. Oh, the um, bundles. Okay, gotcha. The documentation stuff they've been doing for a while now. That that yeah. they're doing that in the the regular amounts <laughs> that that we see. Um, but yeah, those are the two spikes that we've seen. <laughs> okay. Very good. Yeah. And that's the way Amazon works. It, you know, in the next few months, it could be something totally different. Like right now with the, it's with the vendor central accounts getting shut yeah. down. So exactly. It, uh, that, I'm actually curious, have you had anybody reach out to you trying to appeal that decision? Well, they're not really offering an appeal path. Um, we have had people reach out. We don't work on the vendor side. Okay. So um, we not something that we would work on, but it, it will be interesting to see because a lot of the vendors have never done seller before. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there's a lot of people sweating. I'm sure we don't. I don't really have an idea on how many accounts or how big of accounts they're closing down. But uh, from what we've seen, it doesn't seem to be a specific size. I've seen very large ones, and I've seen relatively small ones. It, it doesn't seem mm-hmm. to be based on sales velocity, as far as I can tell. I mean, I've only um, seen a small sampling, but perhaps yeah, they're it, looking at uh, like an internal profitability metric or something. Hard yeah, to say. It's interesting because we've also seen them enforce um, the clause in the vendor contract that says that they can stop you from selling 3P if you have a 1P agreement with them. We've seen them mm-hmm. enforce that a lot this year, which is really? interesting to me interesting. to do before they start kicking people out of 1P. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That would be, that would be really interesting if like they enforced that and then they kicked them out of one P. Yeah. Um, And I'm curious to see, because I do know a number of brands that are selling both. If they try to list some products that they sell to vendor as a seller, the the system won't let them list those products. And I'm curious mm -hmm. to see the people that have been removed from vendor, whether those restrictions are lifted (laughs) um, or not. I'm assuming that some won't be because there's always technical glitches. Yeah. I mean, you would hope so, but Amazon's so big that one team doesn't talk to the other. So it's extremely possible that that could happen for sure. And yeah, that wouldn't be a fun one to have to deal with, with seller support. Yeah. And also, you know, vendor has a higher level of contribution. So now you don't have access to vendor anymore. It's going to be very difficult to edit your listings yep. as a seller. Yeah. And in a, in a case like that, um, it's probably going to be a tough row with seller support because they're going to be like, well, you're going to have to go talk to vendor central and while well, my vendor central's down. So that's probably a case where they should definitely reach out to someone like you guys to see if you can work up the chain, contact email inter- or contact Amazon people internally higher up and get that fixed. Yeah, we've escalated a lot of issues like that. As I, I mentioned earlier, vendor was a very popular way of of messing with people's listings. Yep. Um, so, so we have worked a lot on removing vendor contributions from listings over the years. Yep. Very good. All right, very good. So, if people uh, need your guys's help, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, yes, yeah, so they can go to our website, ecommercechris.com. We have a contact form there. They can fill it out, or they're free to email me or Chris directly. I'm Leah, L-E-A-H at ecommercechris.com and Chris is Chris at ecommercechris.com. And we are on all of the social media platforms. Okay. Excellent, Leah. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a good conversation. Have a great one. This has been another episode of the Amazon Seller School podcast. Thanks for listening, fellow Amazon seller. And always remember, Success is yours if you take it.